Hello everybody, and welcome to Drydock episode 57, the non-shattered Drac edition. You'll be glad to know that there's relatively minimal channel admin, other than to say, well, <laughs> apparently the medals I uh, advertised last week are very popular. I think there's only like half a dozen left, if that. Um, anyway, beyond that, the only other bit of channel admin to announce is that somebody quite helpfully made me aware of the upcoming uh, World of Warships Wargaming event at the Naval Museum in the Netherlands, just north of uh, Amsterdam. So I've decided I will be going there. Um, they have the, at least the bridge and upper deck of one of my favourite uh, late Cold War era ships, the uh, De Zeven Provencian, so I definitely want to check that out. And it seems as good a place as any to meet up with a few subscribers. So as per standard procedure, look for the man wearing the channel logo t-shirt. Other than that, um, let's get on with questions. So today's questions are taken from the videos on HMS Majestic or the Majestic class, that should be, and also the French pre-dreadnought question uh, video, which has proved to be quite popular. So for the Majestic class, the two main books used as references were Warrior to Dreadnought by D.K. Brown, as unsurprising to most of you, and British Battleships 1889 to 1904 by R.A. Burt, which is, uh, again, a very good book to read. And, of course, various other smaller sources and such, including a number of articles in the Warship periodical. And the uh, French Pre-Dreadnought video, well, that was based in part on French battleships of World War One, image shown above, as well as on numerous articles about the various <laughs> French ships contained, again, in the various Warship and Warship International periodicals. Um, if you have any particular interest in a specific ship, let me know in, our, in the comments, and I'll try to link you up with specific sources on specific capital ships. But I must say, the French battleships series... Uh, Battleships of World War One, and then the one that covers uh, 1922 onwards um, by John Jordan and Philip Carassé um, are superb resources if you want to know about French battleships uh, of the steam and steel era. Kelly Breen asks, I was wondering about the pre-war paint scheme. One model, this is in the Majestic class video, showed an almost hospital green upperworks. I always thought that the Royal Navy ships were painted with black hulls, white upperworks, and buff funnels. Were there variations in paint schemes? If so, which of the Majestics had this green and why? The paint scheme that she's referring to is this particular one. Uh, this is a model, it's actually a remote controlled model that was built by some very skilled uh, model makers in the UK, as far as <coughs> I'm aware. And this uh, ex this sort of green uh, upper works, as you say, is not a standard paint scheme for uh, the Majestic Gloss or the pre-war Royal Navy in peacetime colours. This is in fact a experimental low visibility paint scheme that was applied to HMS Hannibal in 1905. So it was a very, very short-lived, very, very one-off um, experimental paint system, which obviously uh, didn't really go anywhere. ST Rub asks, what ship made more ships obsolete, HMS Warrior or USS Monitor? Uh, well, the short answer is HMS Warrior, and that's because the Monitor, as cutting edge and advanced as it was in certain features, was still very much a coastal or riverine craft. The Monitor and most of its derivatives were pretty useless at asserting oceanic control, um, since they couldn't really sail very far off the coast, unless they were towed, as again, unless you were talking about some of the much later ones, um, but the later ones were still to come. So. Monitor itself, basically, it, as I say, is a, is a coastal dash riverine defence ship. Um, it can't really do anything to stop the enemy just sitting off uh, significantly offshore and uh, doing commerce raiding and long distance blockade duty. Warrior, on the other hand, is a fully oceanic, um, seagoing battleship which can hunt down any ship across any part of the ocean when it's launched. So 
the vast majority of warships were made obsolete by warrior whereas monitor although it did make certain warships and certain roles for wooden warships obsolete um, was very much a niche condition ship kendra malm asks how often were ships of opposing navies given the same name it happened a lot more often than you might think. Um, a lot of those uh, doubles or double or even in some cases triple names could be disguised by the fact that it was pronounced or spelt differently um, in different languages. But especially amongst the Western European navies, France, uh, Spain and the UK, due to their shared cultural heritage, quite a lot of the time their ships would pick up uh, similar names. So just taking the... Battle of Trafalgar, for example, and going down the Franco-Spanish fleet's um, order of battle, you have the Spanish two-decker Neptuno, um, which has a corresponding HMS Neptune. You have the three-decker Reo, or Thunderbolt or Thunderer, which uh, the second one might clue you in there was also an HMS Thunderer around. Uh, there was the French Formidable, and there was a uh, British HMS Formidable. There was a French uh, Heros, and a uh, British HMS Hero uh, corresponding. Uh, the French also had a Neptune present, so there, that's a case of three Neptunes. There was Redoutable and there was an HMS Redoubtable. Um, a lot of the Spanish ships were named after saints and other religious figures, which didn't translate too well over at the sim same time period. Um, there was Indomptable, uh, a French ship, also at Trafalgar, and obviously HMS Indomitable is a, a name. Um, there was another French ship, the Intrepide, and there was an HMS Intrepid. There was the Aigle, and of course there was an HMS Eagle. Also present at the Battle of Trafalgar were both the Spanish Argonauta and the French Argonaut, and those were, those were corresponded to by a British HMS Argonaut. Um, it wasn't actually at the battle, so that would have been quite amusing. Um, there was the French Achille and a British HMS Achilles. Uh, which obviously uh, pretty much the same thing and that's just the franco-spanish order of battle at trafalgar so yes there were quite a few um different uh ships uh around that were all of the same or similar names uh, the other fun thing at trafalgar of course was there was on the french side there was the swift sure which had been a british ship which had been captured uh, by the french and on the British side of the Order of Battle of Trafalgar, there was another HMS Swiftsure, which was the successor of the previous Swiftsure. So there were actually two ships built by the same country with the same name um, fighting each other on that particular battle. So that's always fun. Einar Sharp asks, what is freeboard? Freeboard is a naval term that basically means with the hull intact, what is the shortest distance from the waterline to the lowest point? point on uh, the ship's main hull so in this picture of HMS Royal Sovereign you can see the freeboard is pretty much constant from the bow all the way to the back they effectively just follow the top of the black paint um, that's the hull of the ship and as you can see there's no particular dips or anything with that as opposed to you look at something like HMS Hood or, or most destroyers unlike except for the US flush deck destroyers their freeboard would be dictated by the, the dip usually at the stern of the ship Ariane Contreras asks, why didn't the Fleet Aeron produce the Blackburn Firebrand or the Westland Wyvern in large numbers? Meanwhile, it did produce the de Havilland Hornet in large numbers and used it until 1956. This seems the opposite of the US Navy who favoured the Sky Raider and abandoned the F7F early in the Korean War. So, with regards to the Sea Hornet, well, the Sea Hornet was the gotta go faster version of uh, the de Havilland Mosquito, basically. The de Havilland took the concept of the Mosquito and went, right, but what if we made it even quicker and turned it into a proper fighter instead of a fighter bomber? Uh, the Hornet was insanely quick, um, especially for twin engine aircraft driven by propellers. Uh, compared to the F7F, it could fly slightly higher, it could fly slightly further and it was 15 miles an hour faster, 475 miles an hour versus 460 miles an hour um, at maximum speed altitude. So it and it could uh, so it, generally it was just that little bit more capable as a fighter compared to the F7F. Um, but the other thing was that the Hornet was designed um, in its Sea Hornet variants as a night fighter. 
as well as a day fighter. Now, while, while the F7F did have a night fighter variant um, with radar equipped, the Sea Hornet in Royal Navy service very particularly filled that role. Uh, because remember, we're talking about the late 1940s, early 1950s, where radar equipment for aircraft is still fairly big and heavy. And so you need a aircraft with a fair bit of lift and power to be able to get a radar into the sky. And the Hornet, or Sea Hornet NF-21, was pretty much the go-to for that. Also because of its fairly large wing area and um, and high speed, it was very useful as a photo reconnaissance aircraft as well. Um, so it it lasted in service with the Royal Navy for a considerable time for a propeller driven aircraft on the basis of those two specifications basically until uh, radar got small enough and light enough to be able to fit into single engined uh, fighters be they jet or propeller and to be honest mostly jet now as for the other two and why the Royal Navy didn't adopt them similar to how the US Navy adopted the Sky Raider the Firebrand was one aircraft you definitely didn't want to adopt I mean it looks cool and all and on paper its specs seem impressive but it was designed originally as a fighter craft and its fighter capabilities were so poor they basically downgraded it to a strike uh, aircraft in mid, sort of mid design and even then it it wasn't very good. It wasn't particularly agile. It didn't accelerate particularly well. Um, and as you can see from where the, the cockpit is positioned, try landing that thing with tricycle landing gear on a on a uh, carrier. Um, the much respected pilot Eric Winkle Brown, who test flew practically every British aircraft known to mankind in the uh, World War Two period up to sort of a good chunk of the Cold War, looked took one look at it, flew it for a bit, and basically said it was completely unsuitable as a carrier aircraft. So, yeah, not something you want particularly to be deploying in your frontline squadrons. And now, the Westland Wyvern, on the other hand, wasn't anywhere near as terrible as the Firebrand, and actually did serve um, in various uh, operational capabilities, including in the Suez Campaign, as both a strike craft and a fighter. And it was one of these... Uh, Wonderful immediately post-World War II aircraft, which was a turboprop fighter with an ejection seat. Um, it was it was a gloriously insane little aircraft, um, but the reason it didn't take on a similar role to the Sky Raider was, one, it was a fighter with strike craft capabilities as opposed to the Sky Raider, which is more of a flying arsenal that basically just has some kind of weapon that you can shoot at practically any target and not so much a fighter craft uh, but also the Wyvern came into service at a period where the RAF and the fleet air arm had decided pretty early on actually in the mid-1940s um, that pretty much at the end of the World War II that all future aircraft would be a fighter aircraft at least should be jet powered so the Wyvern is despite its turboprop nature and rather eccentric design, is still a fraction behind the Sky Raider in developmental terms. And I say it's not, it wasn't designed as a strike aircraft from the ground up. Um, so with the, Royal, with the various British uh, air, air arms determined to press on with jet-powered aircraft, the reason they didn't have a Sky Raider type is, well, no one had invented a Sky Raider type in the UK by... 1945 and thereafter everyone uh, all the various aircraft companies were trying to develop jet powered fighter and strike aircraft so things like the Wyvern and the Sea Fury were pretty much the end of the line as far as uh, propeller driven aircraft of some sort went for the various British air arms. James Sumpter asks Let's say Britain catches on to the Disregard Treaties acquire heavy surface combatants behaviour early enough to fit the King George V's with their proposed original main battery of three triple 15-inch guns. Are the triple turrets going to have the same teething problems as the Quad 14s? It's entirely possible that they could have suffered some teething problems, but I doubt it would have been anything near as bad as, a quad, as the Quad 14s issues were early on. And that's for several reasons. I mean, the 15-inch gun, it's not the 15-inch 42, it would have been a new design, but the British do have experience building a 15-inch gun, generally, um, as opposed to a 14-inch gun, which they'd never actually had in Royal Navy service willingly. Also, quad turrets are 
significantly more complex than twins or triples. And again, the Royal Navy had never actually had a quad turret in service before. They had just had triples in service before with obviously Nelson and Rodney. So they had some idea, well, to be honest, with Nelson and Rodney, they had some idea how not to build a triple turret. Um, or rather, they had an idea of how not to incredibly downsize and weight save on a triple turret design that was generally sound and then ruin it by um, shaving off things like significant structural members and um, <laughs> other such things. But anyway, that's another story. Um, so yeah, a, a triple turret and a 15-inch gun are both things the Royal Navy has a lot more familiarity with compared to a quad turret and a 14-inch gun. So, overall, yeah, they probably will have some teething problems. I mean, pr pretty much everybody had teething problems of some sort or another with their um, treaty battleships of the 1930s. But I doubt it's going to be anywhere near as bad as the 14-inch gun quad turret problems. Jacob Hammock asks, if the CSS Arkansas hadn't broken a screw, was there any ship at the time that could have faced her? Plenty, actually. Um, CSS Arkansas was not a particularly well-armoured ship by the standards of the time. Um, I mean, it was armed with railroad track rather than solid plates of armour, which is a, a mark against in the first place. But even so, um, as far as I can tell, the actual armour thickness of the iron work was only about three inches with... Uh, a little bit uh, of extra wood backing. I mean, fair enough, the wood backing is sort of 18 to 24 inches thick, but that's not exactly unusual for ironclads of the period. So she's got inadequate armour material to start with, and her armour thickness isn't even approaching something like Warrior. So, yeah, I mean, she's not even the best armoured Confederate Navy ironclad of the American Civil War. So, yeah, there would have been plenty of ships, including ships on her own side and ships in the Union Navy that were around at the time that could quite easily have engaged her. Whether or not they would have broken through the armour depends on the ship in question, but certainly any of the Union 15-inch armed monitors would have had a rather nice time of it um, facing off against the Arkansas. Andrea Marioni asks, Should the Imperial German Navy have been more aggressive in World War I? It's one of those questions in which hindsight is a wonderful thing, um, which makes it very difficult to answer the question objectively, but to a certain extent you can try, given that the opinions of various German naval officers around at the time are available um, to peruse as well. So, should they have been more aggressive in World War One in the first couple of years? Almost certainly. The uh, the initial admirals, Admiral Ingerhol and Admiral uh, von Pohl um, in the high seas fleet seem to have been very timid um, in terms of uh, basically running at the first sign of trouble. Now, fair enough, a part of that was operating under the Kaiser's orders because he didn't want, and the high seas fleet also didn't want to confront the Grand Fleet in open warfare. Jutland was definitely not what they wanted, as evidenced by the fact that as soon as Shear realised that Grand Fleet was there, he just went, nope, and scared it all done out. Um, but they, they had this sort of slightly odd policy of doing these aggressive raids on the coast to bait out part of the British fleet, but then almost never taking advantage of it. Now, it's a high-risk, high-reward strategy, and this is where, I say, hindsight comes in, because with hindsight we can see that actually if they'd been a little bit more aggressive in at least one of their forays, they could have caught uh, Vice Admiral Warrender's battle squadron along with the British battle cruisers um, and run that up against the German battle cruisers and the entire German high seas fleet, which would either have been an utter disaster if the, the British had stuck around to fight or a qualified disaster if a significant portion of the Royal Navy had been forced to turn tail and leg it. Um, so, in those kind of circumstances, given that that was pretty much their war aim, they missed that opportunity in significant part due to the timidity of their commanding officers. So, from that aspect, you can say, yes, actually, they should have been more aggressive. The flip side to that is that, as I said, high-risk, high-reward strategy it equally could have gone horribly, horribly wrong. There were a couple of instances where... 
in part, again, due to commanding officer timidity, they actually dodged running into the Grand Fleet uh, significantly earlier than historically they would at Jutland. And even with that confrontation between um, the Battlecruiser's fleet, uh, Admiral Warrender's squadron, and uh, the rest of the High Seas fleet, even that has the possibility to go horribly wrong. Because if the British battlecruisers had caught the German battlecruisers and managed to either steer or lure them or slow them down or whatever, but or for various circumstances, effectively managed to draw in Admiral Warrender's squadron significantly ahead of the High Seas Fleet uh, joining in, then combined the J British battlecruiser fleet and Admiral Warrender's battle squadron could have made mincemeat of first scouting group. And then when the High Seas Fleet showed up to... Um, for, sort of assist, they could have just turned around and left. Um, now, that's obviously a significantly um, sort of all dice rolling sixes for the British, but it's entirely possible to have happened. It's not one of these things which is completely outside the realms of possibility. And the thing is, to a certain extent, while I might say Admiral von Pohl and Ingerhol were timid, they knew those risks as much as anyone else, and they knew that the High Seas Fleet was pretty much a one-shot playing card. If they played it wrong, and they lost a significant chunk of the High Seas Fleet, that was it as far as the German uh, sort of deterrent fleet in being effort was concerned. The British could afford, to a certain extent, to lose ships and still not sacrifice their superiority. If the Germans lost significant numbers of ships any chance of contesting the the Grand Fleet, even in sections, was pretty much off the table immediately. So, yeah, it's it's a difficult one to answer. Personally, I would have, and to be honest, Cheer and Hipper both agreed, yes, they should have been a bit more aggressive, but you can see, given the context of what they were facing and uh, the expectations they had pressing down on them from the Kaiser, you can understand why they didn't uh, early on. And um, things like Battle of the Dogger Bank um, rather illustrated exactly just how close a thing that kind of high-risk, high-reward strategy could run. Attila Katona Bugner asks, Would you like to see more older warships in World of Warships, uh, like armoured cruisers and stuff? Yes, I certainly would, actually. Um, I mean, we've got a few protected dash theoretically in some cases almost armoured cruisers in the game at sort of tier 2, tier 3 era but the general trend of World of Warships is pretty much starting with uh, the sort of mid-1900s dreadnought era and onwards with the odd exception like Mikasa. Now I would definitely want to see many more older warships um, armoured cruisers, protected cruisers pre-dreadnoughts etc the only two issues with that is one, well, um, yeah, we've already got tier one, tier two, etc. So you'd almost effectively have to create a negative tier system um, because they're not going to be competitive with the later ships at tier two, tier three, etc. in general. So obviously not creating a negative tier system, but you'd almost have to create maybe a second set of tier systems uh, that maybe start at 1890. So maybe, a, or maybe 1880. So an eight, maybe an 1880 to say 1905-ish time period tier system. Um, I mean, the, the basic mechanics of the game are already there, so it shouldn't be that hard. But it would be obviously quite expensive to do, since you'd have to recreate tech trees for loads of different nations, and you'd run into um, some significant problems, such as the fact that certain nations' tech trees simply wouldn't exist because either the nation itself didn't exist or they weren't building ships of that of a particular type at the time um, and also you'd have um, issues with the fact that some ships are just flat out bad so game balancing them is going to be quite difficult um, beyond that the only other thing that they'd really have to change would be well if you were there for the beta, reintroducing manually controlled secondary batteries, because as I think anyone who's played the Mikasa or Mikasa in um, World of Warships can confirm, 
under their current game mechanics, trying to fight with just the main battery guns is an exercise in pain. So, yeah, they they had the sec manual secondaries in the beta. They have the manual secondaries in the World of Warship Splits as well, the mobile game. So if they re-enabled that feature, even if it was just for this hypothetical uh, second set of, of tech trees, that would be necessary to make it playable because ships at that time relied on their secondaries and to extension tertiaries are just as much as their primaries so it would be a very interesting game i mean there'd be minimal to no torpedoes um yes yeah, suppose you could put a few torpedo boats if in if in if you wanted but they'd be very limited in capability um so it'd be much more of a guns game there'd be no aircraft yeah so actually now that i come to think of it a lot of players would probably welcome that no aircraft few destroyers um, dash torpedo boats with minimal capability and almost entirely gun duel based with a bunch of ramming. Um, that'd be quite quite fun actually. So yes, definitely, I'd like to see it. Um, don't know if World of Warships will ever do it though. Warren Lemkula asks, since Congress starved the US Navy of pretty much any funding between the Civil War and World War One, were there any interesting designs that naval designers came up with but Congress would not allow them to build? And if Congress had not starved the US Navy after the Civil War, how large could the Navy have been by the time World War One broke out? Well, two designs that stick in my mind from the 1900s era US Navy um, are the one that's shown above, which was, yes, and that you're reading that correctly, a torpedo battleship. Um, yes, <laughs> it's basically a, uh, a, sh a battleship that was armed with quite a number of submerged torpedo tubes and was really more of a proto-battle cruiser, um, but designed to run around torpedoing everybody at high speed. <laughs> um, a, a concept that wouldn't really see the light of day in anybody else's navy, with the possible exception of some of the dubious refits to HMS Courageous and Glorious before someone did something sensible and turned them into a carrier. The other one that sticks in my mind is the original American proposals for their own battle cruisers, which effectively involved taking a couple of turrets off of a Wyoming class, thinning down the armour and turning them into kind of adaptations of the Invincible class, but with a slightly better broadside, which luckily for everybody involved didn't go anywhere because they would, would have been built around the time that that the uh, Germans were turning out Moltke, the Moltke class and Seidlitz and the British had moved on to the Lion class, so they would have been hopelessly outdated by the time they were built. Um, but it just goes to show that, well, the US Navy being starved of funds in a lot of ways was bad, but in some ways prevented some really embarrassing ships being put out into the field. As far as uh, how big could the US Navy have been if Congress hadn't starved it of funds, it's going to depend almost entirely on when and how Congress provides money, because the US Navy coming out of the American Civil War had something of an obsession with monitors, and monitors are definitely not the way to go if you want to be an oceanic um, sea-dominating navy. They're very good for coastal defence, but they really are not practical for much else beyond that. Um, if the U US Navy had just kept being supplied with funds, they could have faced a significant block, block obsolescence problem around the pre-Dreadnought era, where they would have gone entirely down the wrong tech tree and basically had this massive fleet of expensive monitors to keep up and then discovered that everybody else's pre-treadnoughts could quite easily sail rings around them um, and blow them out of the water, which would have been rather embarrassing. Um, if, on the other hand, the US Navy has its funding throttled immediately after the American Civil War, which is entirely reasonable, as most navies get big funding cuts after a major war, and then picked up again in, say the mid-1880s, kind of around the same time that the French were trying to uh, extricate themselves from the Jeune Ecole. Obviously, Dreadnought is going to obsolete um, all the pre-Dreadnoughts eventually, but the US Navy did a fairly creditable job, even as it was coming in slightly late in the game, in the, eight, in the sort of mid to late 1890s, um, with generating a fairly capable fleet of pre-Dreadnoughts, um, stacked turrets aside, we won't mention those, um, the main problem they had was cruiser design. Now, they did some very dubious things with the so-called peace cruisers, and their armoured cruisers were possibly a little bit too overgunned and 
I mean, and that's not even a ribbit of American uh, tendencies to stick guns everywhere, but they were literally, apart from the Olympia, um, generally actually carrying guns that were a bit too heavy for their intended role. But again, you could see that as an artifact of the limited funding they had of either basically, well, we've got minimal amounts of money, so we've got to make something, hence the peace cruisers, or we have minimal amounts of money. In the case of the armoured cruisers, we've got to go for the biggest and nastiest thing we can come up with, hence the uh, the armoured cruisers they did come up with. A US Navy that's provided significant funding starting in the mid-1880s and could therefore generate ships like multiple versions of USS Olympia um, and hopefully get some sanity into its pre-dreadnought design scheme by 1900 would be quite comfortably given the US's industry uh, come up to sort of uh, either rank two or three in naval terms by the time Dreadnought rolls around. So the two power standard that the Royal Navy had adopted, which obviously at the time initially focused on France and Russia, and then later on France and Germany, would almost certainly have adapted to Germany and America as the two powers. The industrial capabilities and necessary focus of the U.S. armed forces probably at that point wouldn't have allowed them to match or exceed the Royal Navy, um, because we're talking about Congress not starving the U.S. Navy of funds. We're not talking about Congress opening the floodgates on the funding. Um, obviously, everything resets with Dreadnought, but that could have left the them with a relatively decent force of modern armoured cruisers and protected cruisers which would have stood them in fairly good stead for the dreadnought race uh, actually having a fleet screen and then assuming the US wants to get stuck into the naval arms race properly I mean that's actually probably going to completely change the face of the naval arms race in in the uh, dreadnought period because um, the politics of it with both Germany and America building up a large navy would cause the Royal Navy to change its priorities completely. So it's a little bit of a butterfly scenario that we can't predict, but again, industrial capacity, build times, technology-wise, etc., the US Navy could quite easily have outbuilt the... Well, easily, not necessarily, but with the appropriate funding could comfortably have outbuilt the Germans. Um they probably wouldn't quite have been able to outbuild the Royal Navy, but unlike the German forces, which never really came close to matching the Royal Navy, the US Navy, assuming that Congress for the Dreadnought race is opening the floodgates of, of funding at that point, because hey, it's an arms race, probably could have come up with a fleet that at least numerically could challenge the Royal Navy, not necessarily exceed it, but maybe get to 80% strength or so. The Pro main problem they would have had would have been in an effort to mass manufacture shipping they would have had quite a few duds on their hands like possibly more of the South Carolinas and uh, the sticking to uh, VT vertical triple expansion technology for a while which would have rendered a portion of their fleet somewhat less than useful but it certainly would have put the US Navy in effective fleet terms on a level above the high seas fleet going into the First World War, which would, as I say, would have changed things massively to a point that, in a relatively short answer in a dry dock, there's no way I could predict exactly where everything would stand at that point. Thomas Farley asks a question about battleship tactics. Specifically, why in a battleship fight is every battleship given a different enemy target? Uh, in the age of sail, with fixed short-range cannon, you had to shoot what was in front of you, but once turrets come in, that's not the case. Wouldn't it be more effective to concentrate the fire of three or four ships against one enemy to knock it out quickly, then move on to the next target? In theory, yes, but there are a number of practical issues with it, with the idea. One of which is that in the age of steam and shells, it's much easier for an enemy to decline a battle, and so if an enemy is hopelessly outnumbered to the point that you could concentrate um, three or four ships on a single target, the chances are they're probably just going to refuse the battle and retreat. So unless you can pin them in place or trap them in some other manner, a fight is generally going to be between sides where maybe not necessarily even, 
but at least the odds are not going to be much greater than 2 to 1, and probably considerably less than that. Now that leads to a second issue, which is that in those circumstances, if you have multiple ships focusing on one ship, in theory you might knock it out uh, quickly, but uh, there are other factors which we'll discuss in a minute, but one of the major things as the British band at Jutland is that if you have multiple ships engaging a single vessel, then that means that there's at least one possibly more enemy ships that are unengaged, and the accuracy and rate of fire of a ship that's unengaged and is effectively on peacetime exercises is considerably more than a ship that's being shot at um, with the disruptive effect that that has and potentially uh, counter maneuvers that's having to make. Uh, which means that in the time that you have three or four ships concentrating on one, it's entirely possible that the enemy ships that you're not engaging might start landing hits across multiple of your ships and degrading their combat capability rather quickly, which would be a major problem. On top of that, there is uh, another issue, which is that with the kind of long-range gunfire made possible by turret-mounted uh, long-barrel guns, there's a considerable amount of flight time and the, to the shells, and the targets are significantly smaller. So what this means is that, given that you're not going anywhere near get a guaranteed hit first time, you're looking at a ship that fires, then you may be waiting 10, 15, 20, up to 30 seconds before the shells land. Now, if you've got three or four ships firing at the same time, you don't know exactly how long your shell flight time is. Um, you've got a rough idea, but you've got a margin of error of a few seconds either way. And so when shells start landing, you have relatively little idea as to whether or not they're your shells, or are they the ship in front of you, or are they the ship behind you? Um, this was why in uh, the latter part of the First World War, the interwar period and the Second World War, ships were issued with die packs um, for their shells in order to specifically to address this kind of problem. Um, but going into sort of the 1900s and World War One era, it, it was a serious concern, um, basically, that, well, yeah, so you, you don't know whose shells are whose. And even in World War II, um, misidentification of shell splashes still happened. It, at Jutland, this was, again, another issue of the fact that uh, one of the reasons for Tiger's horrendous accuracy was for a long time she saw, saw the shell splashes from Lion's guns, thought they were hers, and therefore was correcting on the basis of completely erroneous data. So this is a major problem when you're concentrating fire from three or four ships. Um, you're talking about shells landing, if assuming they're firing half salvos, maybe every mm, 10 seconds or so, at which point it's going to be almost a continuous plume of shell splashes at which point good luck figuring out which ones were yours um so you ironically enough although in theory you'd think that concentrating fire all in one would um allow for quicker enemy knockout it probably actually will make it a lot longer because none of your ships will be able to meaningfully correct for range unless they've somehow magically got a dead on shot the first time now assuming that all your ships have die packs for their shells and can somehow obviate the other enemy ships, perhaps by crossing the T, or just by having that massive numerical advantage anyway, then yes, in theory, you could make this tactic work, but it's going to be a very niche tactic for very niche situations. Um, in the broader terms of general engagements, you want to be engaging like for like. Uh, the only exceptions to that would be, as I say, either where you've got massive odds in your favour, or where the enemy ships, the other enemy ships aren't rated as a major threat to you. So this is what happens kind of at the Battle of Denmark Strait. The intention was for Prince Wales and Hood to both concentrate on Bismarck and then deal with Prince Wigan because they didn't rate a heavy cruiser as a particular threat to them in the short term. Uh, didn't quite work out that way uh, in terms of both misidentifying targets and um, obviously uh, Hood detonating relatively shortly into the battle, but there you go. Brandon Davis asks, have you heard of the USS Bori, a Clemson-class destroyer, and would you do a special episode on it? Yes, yes I have. Uh, Bori's fight with U-405 using anything up to and including flare guns, thrown tactical knives, and uh, empty four-inch shell casings, amongst other things. Uh, 
th yeah, small arms gunfight with a U-boat that's stuck to your keel. Um, it's a very impressive story, and it is something that is down to have a special video done on it. Um, unfortunately, as I say, the, the special videos list is about two to three years long at this point, so um, it's not on <laughs> it's not on the list high enough up to get done this year unless uh, that changes via Patreon vote. But it is something that will eventually be covered. Bill Luster asks, how severe was the Royal Navy fuel oil shortage in World War I? Was it the true reason they declined the newer US Navy battleships for the Grand Fleet, or was it a polite cover for another reason? So the fuel oil situation was the primary reason that they didn't want the Pennsylvanias or the Nevadas showing up. Um, it wasn't quite as bad a shortage as people sometimes make out. It would it was more of a strategic decision more than a we literally cannot fuel your ships um oil fuel was in something of short supply um mostly due to submarine activity it wasn't that the royal navy was going to run out of oil fuel anytime soon um they had the queen elizabeths which were oil fired and uh the uh, r class which were also by this point oil fired along with well, actually quite a number of capital ships, the, the Renown's coming into service as well, and practically every other um, capital ship in the Royal Navy was using at least oil spray, plus a lot of cruisers and destroyers were oil-fired. So there was an awful lot of oil fuel being consumed by the Grand Fleet, and this was basically the main issue. In most of the ships using oil spray, it was a small portion of their overall fuel. So a single tanker carrying, say, uh, 8,000 tonnes of fuel oil could supply maybe a, a, up to a dozen capital ships that were using a mixture of coal and oil firing, whereas on a ship that was using purely oil firing, that, that tanker could probably fuel one with a little bit of left, little bit of fuel left over. Um, and so, logistically speaking, adding in four additional ships, uh, four additional U.S. Navy ships that would all require effectively a full tank, a full large tanker's worth of oil, would put an unnecessary strain on the oil uh, flow into Scapa flow. So, it, it as I say, it could have been done. It would have strained the logistical system uh, uh, somewhat, and it would have put the Grand Fleet at risk of having potentially a capital ship unable to be fueled if a particular if they'd had a particularly bad month of tankers getting hit. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't like the Royal Navy was going to run out of fuel oil anytime soon. But it made a lot more sense to bring in the coal burners. Um, since apart from anything, the ones that were brought in didn't noticeably slow the fleet down, and ultimately it was more about adding firepower to the Grand Fleet in order to enable the Royal Navy to decommission some of their older pre-dreadnoughts from other duties in order to then man more escort ships and fleet screen units. Uh, Bryce MacDonald asks, what are your thoughts on the Americans' bat incendiary bomb, the pigeon-guided bomb, and others? Do you have any knowledge of other weapons or plans that go down the same path of lunacy? Although I think, to be honest, using animal-guided weapons is a potentially a little bit cruel um i'm not necessarily in favor of it, um, them at all but of the two that you mentioned the bat bomb was almost certainly the by far the most effective weapon at least uh, judging by the uh, amount of carnage that one of them managed to cause to its own testing base um the pigeon guided weapon uh, kind of worked but I'd say it was a lot less reliable and probably a lot less lethal than the Bat Bomb, um, albeit the Bat Bomb does kind of rely on your target being highly incendiary in the first place, which was fine for bombing Japanese cities, might not necessarily have worked so well in other theatres of the war. In terms of other weapons that use animals, obviously you've got the some somewhat mimetic um, anti-tank dogs uh, that apparently both sides thought about using in uh, the the Eastern Front in between Russia and Germany, um, mostly the Russians apparently, but the accounts vary. But anyway, yeah, th those didn't work out particularly well. But if you want the absolute craziest in animal-powered weapons, welcome to Blue Peacock. And of course, given that this is a crazy weapon that involves animals, it of course has to have been invented by the British. This is a 10 kiloton nuclear landmine. Yes, and the idea was to bury these things in uh, Germany, 
well, where else, um, in the event of a Soviet invasion. And the idea was that you could then manually detonate them, although quite how long a wire you'd need to manually detonate a 10 kiloton nuclear mine, I don't know. Um, or if the wire wasn't triggered for whatever reason, after an eight-day timer. But the kicker, and the animal power part, comes in the fact that, well... Northern Germany gets very cold in the winter, and being that this was the 1950s, electronics weren't particularly advanced and suffered some rather severe problems when it came to operating in cold temperatures. So they tried a number of solutions. They thought about putting extra insulation in the bomb, um, some form of electrical heater, etc. None of that particularly worked out, so the final proposal was to put a chicken inside, um, give it a bit of food and water, and the idea was, well, the chicken would last with the food and water supplies for about seven or eight days, which was as long as the timer needed to run, and well, what all the wires needed to be able to receive signal anyway. And the idea was that chicken's body heat would be just about enough to keep the electronics warm enough to stop the bomb from freezing up and not working. So yes, chicken-powered nukes for the ultimate in your KFC needs. Luke's the Lynx asks, how effective would the Yamatos have been if they'd all been built Shinano-esque frontline combat fleet carriers, and then could Yamato, with the large amount of aircraft carried, have been a tide turner that turned the roll turned midway? Oh, well, assuming that they do Shinano-style conversions, I don't think they'd be particularly effective because Shinano was an awful conversion of a carrier. I mean. Let's let's stop and, and, and take a moment to compare, shall we? Shinano, remember, was basically supposed to be used as a backline support carrier taking on damaged aircraft and sending out uh, resupplies. But anyway, the modernised variant of Karga was a 38,200-ton ship, uh, obviously based off of a originally Tosa class battleship. So it's just over eight hundred feet long, just over a hundred feet wide, with a thirty foot just over thirty foot draft, and it can carry ninety aircraft. The Shinano, on the other hand, is pushing seventy thousand tons, so almost not quite, but almost double the displacement of Karga. It's 872 feet long, 119 feet wide, and has a 33-foot draft. Now, fair enough, the draft doesn't make too much odds, really, but you're looking at a ship that's another 60 feet long and has, more importantly, perhaps, uh, another 15-ish, just under 15-ish foot of beam. It's a substantially larger vessel than Karga, and they both have the same speed of about 28 knots. And yet, <laughs> Karga can carry 90 aircraft. Shinano can carry 47. Now, if that's not a complete mess-up of a conversion to a carrier, I don't know what is. Um, yeah, you're talking about a gigantic carrier that can carry about as many planes as Ruggio. Um, <laughs> yeah, this, if they did three Shinano conversions, I don't think that's going to make the blindest bit of difference to the way the Pacific campaign goes. If they'd done something actually vaguely sensible and done an actual cargo-style conversion on Yamato and Musashi, given that Yamato would just about scrape into service for Midway, assuming it had been converted almost from the start, then... Potentially, it could have changed things, given that Midway was very much a case of if if it gets found, it gets hurt very badly and possibly killed. So having another deck which, with proper conversion, might be able to send upwards of 100-plus aircraft into the sky, yeah, sure, that might turn Midway. Uh, that might allow the Japanese to finish off um, all, pre all American carriers present before the... Um, American aircraft show up later in the day and obliterate the Kido Butai, but that's a bit of a toin toss. Uh, toin toss? Coin toss. I'm flipping it. I'm even drifting into spoonerisms now. <laughs> anyway. So, yes. Uh, a, a theoretical, properly converted Yamato carrier at Midway might have turned the tide, but it would still be very much a swings of roundabouts as to whether or not that happened. 
Um, alternatively, the US Navy might just bag a really big kill even earlier in the war. Um, but it could, it could have had an impact. But as I say, this, this would assume a very early conversion and a proper conversion, not a Shinano-style conversion. Uh, Shinano conversion's awful. Matthew Sturbjack, I think, asks, If Japan had sent a declaration of war and didn't launch a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, what would a major fleet engagement off Wake Island look like? So I've kind of hinted at this before with various responses to questions about if the Pacific Fleet had sortied uh, before Pearl Harbor. But basically it comes down to probably nothing good for the US Navy. Um, a full-strength Kido Butai with all its carriers, all its um, elite pilots in place that early in the war... Um, when American anti-aircraft guns, both in terms of number and fire control systems, are significantly less capable um, than they would be in the mid to late uh, war periods. And with the US Navy having only a limited number of carriers um, in theatre available with aircraft of relatively limited capability, because there was a significant step change um, throughout uh, 1942 in terms of aircraft capability amongst US Navy forces. Um, if the first engagement of major engagement of the war is a theoretical battle of Wake Island, where it's um, the full force of the Japanese Navy coming in against a uh, hypothetically deployed US Pacific fleet, it's, it's not going to end well. Um, the Japanese will have the advantage in numbers, they'll have the in of aircraft, in training, in effective weaponry um, from their aircraft again. So, yeah, it, it would probably end with a very, very significant loss for the US Navy. It's entirely possible there might be some kind of Midway-esque, well, look, we just found some random Japanese carriers occurring, but that's a very much a luck of the dice occurrence. I wouldn't bet on it. Um, yeah, the, the American carrier force that they would have had available would have put up a stiff fight i'm fairly sure but with a, a battle a standard battle line with its restricted speed you're going to have the problem of either tying the american fleet together as a bunch of effectively sitting ducks or you're going to have the carriers exposed and away from uh, the battleships which means that well best case scenario for the americans is the Japanese go after the carriers, in which case the carriers can fight back, they're a bit faster, they can evade, and of course they have their fighters for air support. Um, worst case scenario is the American carriers try to launch strikes and in the middle of having deployed most of their aircraft, a mass wave of uh, Japanese strike craft show up and go after the battle line, which would be operating independently because of the massive speed difference. Um, at which point you kind of probably get not quite as bad as Pearl Harbor, but almost as bad as Pearl Harbor, except this time you can't recover the ships. So, yeah, it's definitely not something you really want to try and uh, have occur, as far as I can tell, um, in the beginning of the American involvement in the Second World War. And finally, for questions for this week, uh, Gabriel A. Hawkins asks, why did modern British battleships not slope their armour belts, i.e. King George V and Vanguard, and do you agree with the decision? I never understood it. Uh, imagine the stopping power of King George V's belt, but sloped to 18 degrees. Uh, not that I know that much about tanks, but King George V and Vanguard remind me of the Tiger tank, built by a country that's forgotten more about armour protection than most navies know about armour protection, yet it was not sloped. Please explain. On the face of it, it does seem a rather odd decision, but there were a number of key factors that guided this. Bear in mind that the British had already experimented with inclined armour on Nelson and Rodney, so they weren't in entirely um, unfamiliar with the concept. The reason for the external belt armour was a number of considerations. Firstly, was that they wanted the armour to be in a fairly deep belt, i.e. it's actually height. Um, so they wanted the armour belt to cover an extensive area of the ship, um, both to protect against incoming fire fairly high up and also to protect against a certain degree of diving shells, which was a threat they were aware of to a certain amount, a degree. Now, in order to do that, you needed to minimise the 
overall weight sort of weight per inch of the armor to extend it as far as possible one of the problems with inclined armor is that well if you imagine the classic uh, right angle triangle you're effectively um, using the hypotenuse instead of uh, the longest straight edge um, for, in, for an inclined belt which means that per inch you're actually for the same thickness of armor you're using more armor therefore more weight therefore your belt can't protect as much height wise so there's a compromise already another compromise is the fact that bear in mind these ships were limited by the treaty 35,000 ton so you could have either an internal angled belt as per quite a number of US Navy ships and the Nelsons or you could have an external angled belt um, as Montana was supposed to have um, the there are advantages and disadvantages to both with the external angled belt this offers the best of all possible eventualities but it also means that the if you're going to have a given protected volume um, at the base of the armor belt that means the upper part of your ship has to flare out a lot more which means more weight which is a problem for a 35,000 ton displacement limited ship if you use an internal belt similar to the South Dakotas your problem is then twofold well threefold actually one is that if your armor belt is damaged you've then got to go into the structure of the ship to fix it um, secondly because your armor belt now angles down inside the ship it means your protected citadel volume inside is reduced which means you can't get as much um, machinery magazines etc in place without becoming overly cramped and it also means that some of your secondary defensive features such as just general spacing and bulkheads and compartments for torpedo defense etc can't be as extensive which um, again is a problem if you want to protect your ship against all possible threats and thirdly there is the problem that with an internal belt a hit that even if your armor belt protects you from it will have penetrated part of your ship and the explosion and the splinters and the shell punching through in the first place will have created a hole or multiple holes in your ship which will allow water in which means that even if your armor belt performs perfectly adequately and protects you from the hit you're still going to be shipping water and therefore encountering a list and possibly slowing so there are quite a number of disadvantages to taking on an internal sloped armored belt as well there's also a range to consider the u.s adoption of the sloped armored belt and indeed the use of the sloped armored belt on the nelsons and uh, as developed in the g3s and n3s as well back in the 20s was predicated on an assumption of extremely long-range combat where the additional sloping given by the belt significantly magnifies the effective thickness of the belt for incoming shells however by the 1930s it was clear to the british that although effective battle range had extended beyond what it was in world war one it was not actually going to be anywhere near as close in their view at least um to the kind of extreme long distances that the americans thought battle was going to take place at and which strongly influenced their ideas of belt armor sloping at which point the angle of shells at the kind of battle ranges the british were expecting was considerably shallower which then significantly decreased the effectiveness of a sloped armored belt and if you'd sacrifice thickness uh, absolute thickness in order to give yourself the weight necessary to have an inclined belt the british concluded it was entirely possible that a shell might then punch through at a shallow angle um in a sort of a relatively close range engagement um, it might punch through a belt that had been thinned for the purposes of sloping whereas just a monolithic slab-sided belt that was several inches thicker might resist that kind of shell and considering that they knew that accuracy increased with uh, commensurate to the decrease in range they were also aware that um, battles would inevitably close the range fairly quickly and ultimately the kind of not quite cheat effect but you you get the kind of idea the the increased apparent thickness caused by a uh, sloped belt that was thinner could to a certain degree be matched by simply having physically more metal in the way using a monolithic slab belt so those were all the various considerations but primarily the one of the primary ones apart from the weight and volume restriction issues was the fact that 
British thought on what was going to be effective battle range and practical battle range differed significantly from what the Americans thought. So they were designing ships to what they thought they were going to range is they were going to fight at. As it turned out, the British were more correct than the Americans, but uh, it took war to prove the point. In an ideal world, as you mentioned, you probably would have had this kind of belt sloped out, but in order to do that, you would need a kind of unrestricted um, displacement design like the Montanas, where you could afford to have the sheer thickness, which the British preferred, and which I think is probably actually the better choice. And then if you do it on an inclined external uh, belt, then pretty much your only potential issue is slightly increased displacement but as I said if you've decided you're not going to worry that all that much about your overall displacement that eliminates that as a concern and everything else is coming up roses for you. So hopefully that provides a quick primer on that particular design decision. Now that brings us to the end of a dry dock episode 57 for the day. However, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that this video has some time still to run. The reason for this is twofold, and they're both to do with the ship design competitions. So, this, uh, this time around, the challenge was to design a response to HMS Invincible. And I must say, actually, the standard of entries this time around was really high. And <laughs> thanks to some help from a couple of Discord members, we were able to sort through the entries and provide fairly extensive feedback for most of them. So there will be a link, uh, hopefully appearing in the description, which will cover the finalists and all the other entries. So what uh, what we will do now is we will announce the winners. So the winner, the three winners for the competition, are as follows. And this the the place for um. The first and second place were very, very close call. In the end, we actually had to do a coin toss. So, for in first place, as a by the decision of a coin toss, is SMS Lissa, an Austro-Hungarian battle cruiser. In second place, uh, again decided by said coin toss, was is HMS Jupiter, a British battle cruiser that was designed was designed as an alternative to the sort of set repeat invincibles. And in third place, uh, although only by a smidge, is USS Concord, a American battlecruiser, as the name might suggest. So if you design those ships, you know who you are, please get in contact with me and we can discuss your prizes, which we will um, then hopefully show everybody once you've decided what you want. Um, honorable mention, goes to the Barbaros Heyreden, uh, an Ottoman battle cruiser, which uh, kind of hamstrung itself by restricting itself to uh, the length of existing Ottoman dockyards, even though it was being built overseas, um, which was possibly a step a step too far in terms of restrictions, but it was appreciated as a um, as a sort of vi attempt at a degree of historical accuracy. Uh, but the main reason that although its combat capability isn't quite up with there with the other ships, the the main reason that Barbaros Heredin gets an honourable mention is the fact that it included a great many small details which were very historically accurate, such as the use of torpedo tubes, um, the correct calibre and style and date of guns, etc. etc. So um, those are the, the prize winners. The other finalists, in case uh, anyone was interested, that we had to pick from from the shortlist were USS Montana, USS Guerrier, Aslan Duz of the Russian Empire, RHS Marathon of the uh, Kingdom of Greece, and Lamotte Piquet of the Republic of France. All of those designs were definitely in the running as finalists, but in the end I had to make a decision for a top three, um, and they were all very close to getting in there. So that's the finalists. And each of the finalist entries that didn't uh, make the podium, as it were, um, write into me if you want, and I have a finalist's prize lined up for you. Now, as I say, um, 
there will be more information about those ships forthcoming in addition to the um, spring shot file reports and comments from the judges which will be attached uh you say in the description to the video but there's also a few other issues to um sort out which is the some of the uh, winners from the previous design competition asked for uh, a couple of items which could be addressed in video form and so we're going to do those now i didn't forget and although it's just scraping in uh, as the next competition was uh announced well the next competition winners were announced it still is being done so anyway let's go on with that so one of the winning entries from last time the last competition under the um cobbled together category of cruiser killer um type or super cruiser i guess <clears throat> was the kingdom class and the designer of that particular uh, vessel has asked me to discuss it in a little bit more detail, which I will. So I will first read off the law for it. So the Kingdom class was designed with the potential threat of further Japanese expansionism in the Pacific and was laid down in late 1938, completing in late 1939. Her design is somewhat bulky, with arguably excess armour and machinery space. This, plus her hull form, allows her to be remarkably steady with good sea keeping even in poor weather conditions. The theory behind this design decision is that the ship can remain in combat under virtually any weather condition. With radar continuing to develop into the 1940s, it's estimated that she would make an excellent leader of small cruiser and destroyer task forces. She's designed with excess range as as well as the requirements of the United Kingdom to require any vessel to have a higher than average range so that units may help defend Britain's many holdings around the world. This also has a secondary benefit, meaning that barring damage and fuel leaks, a fuel quantity can virtually be ignored during combat, thus reducing the mental workload on command staff. In addition, whilst somewhat paltry, her secondary armament and anti-aircraft suite could easily be upgraded and extended during wartime on account of the sheer bulk of the craft and the available deck space. In essence, the ship was designed with potential extended combat duties far away from home in mind, but would fare quite well close to home as well. Her excessive bulk, steadiness and sea keeping allow her to engage in combat under a, under a wider variety of conditions and circumstances, and has the added benefit of making her difficult to sink barring critical hits, as the risk of potential critical hits is further mitigated by the higher than average amount of armour for a ship in this role. Five ships of this class will be built and are as follows. HMS Kingdom, the prototype recommissioned as HMS Sapphire, once uh, trials have been complete, HMS Emerald, HMS Ruby, HMS Topaz and HMS Amethyst. The class in this alternate timeline would somewhat derogatorily be referred to by some sailors and members of Parliament as the Royal Jewels due to the expense of their construction and arguably excessive use of resources. Now, one of the reasons this particular ship... Uh, topped in in the winners of that particular category is comparative to quite a number of supercruiser designs its displacement is somewhat sane and therefore theoretically at least somewhat buildable with a just over 26,000 ton standard displacement so it's not Alaska grade um, sort of displaces as much as most battleships but it's also not pushing too close towards the kind of actually pretty decent heavy cruisers that were under conceptual development at the start of World War II, so it's not going to be rapidly obsoleted by something like a Baltimore or a Des Moines. Um, its armament is nine 12-inch guns in three triple turrets in the fairly traditional two forward uh, super-firing one aft layout. Its secondary battery is six 5.25-inch guns in <coughs> six single mounts. Now that is a little bit of a departure from the twin mounts, and would have required the development of a new mount for the 5.25 inch gun but hey it's 5.25 inch gun it's attention to detail in terms of what the british were using in anti-aircraft rolls um although single or twin 4 or 4.5 inch aa guns would also have sufficed um 32 40 millimeter guns the belt armor is 12 inches thick with a just under six inch thick deck so it's very well armored for its role as a cruiser killer that that deck is going to reject pretty much any eight inch shell that's being thrown around and will quite happily deal with the 11 inch shells of something like a deutschland class as well um the armor is more than adequate to resist eight inch shell fire um as, as in any kind of reasonable combat uh, scenario uh 
Oh, and well, it's it's twelve inch. It's not going to stand up to something like a Bismarck or a Littorio, but in theory, this ship probably would stand a semi decent chance of taking on one of, say, the Italian uh, modernized battleships or the Scharnhorsts. Although, in both cases, in the case, Italian case, firepower; in the Scharnhorst case, fire um, armor protection. Both of the other ships have a certain advantage over it. It's still in the mix with its modern 12-inch guns. The range is quite good, and as the designer said, it's a quite a solid ship, so it fits the Royal Navy's uh, ideas of being able to fight in the North Sea in the middle of a storm, um, because they like doing that kind of thing. So Springshot rates it as having excellent machinery, good dis uh, displacement factors, good um, Roll. It's got a slow, easy roll. It's a steady gun platform. So overall, yes. Although it's somewhat overbuilt, and you probably could slim it down by two or three thousand tons, it's a it's a nice, solid brawler of a super cruiser. Of course, the chances of the British actually building one realistically in 1939 are slim to none. But in an alternate timeline where they had a bit more money, it's it is the kind of thing the British would have probably tried to pull off, given that they were a little bit late in the game with the super cruisers. Um, but they were aiming for the smaller, punchier designs when they got their stuff down on paper, as opposed to the sort of rather extravagant Alaskas or some of the stuff that the Russians came up with, or indeed the Scharnhorst, which are basically battleships. The other requested uh, video-based prize from the last competition was a five-minute guide to the destroyer USS Radford DD-446. So look forward to that next weekend as you will get a double five-minute guide uh, special. So you'll get the regularly scheduled one and then about an hour later there will be one on the Radford as well. So hopefully that rounds out that particular aspect of the competition. And lastly but not leastly there were quite a number of rather impressive artworks submitted for the various design entries in the previous competition. So although uh, a number of them did not win, um, it, I can't really let that kind of hard work go to waste with only me seeing it. <coughs> Excuse me. So therefore, for the last few minutes of this video, I will... And as you might have noticed earlier while I was talking about um, other things uh, competition related, I will grace your screens with some of the rather impressive and wonderful artwork that was submitted for the previous competition. And whilst we're taking a look at that, I guess it is time to announce the next competition uh, for those of you who want to get involved in that. And so this competition will run from whatever the date is today, the Sunday, the... Uh, let me see, Sunday the 1st of September, and the this competition will run again for about six weeks, with the final submission date for entries being Sunday the 20th of October. And so that will be the penultimate competition of this year. And this competition is going to throw people possibly for a little bit of a loop because it's not going to be a straight up, well, is your ship better than this other entry ship? This is going to rely a lot more on historical nuance. So in this scenario, we're going to take the year as 1914. And you're given a total displacement of 16,000 tons. Now, you might think, well, what? what? on earth could you build for 16,000 tons historically in 1914? Well, you're not building one ship, you're building a class of ships. Specifically, you are building a scout-light cruiser type of vessel in keeping with the nation of your choice. And as I say, you have a 16,000 ton maximum displacement to use up. So you could, for example, um, design a ship with a displacement of just over 3,000 tons and build five of them. Or you could design a ship with a displacement of 4,000 tons and build four. Um, or you could build three ships of just over 5,000 tons. Or you could build two ships of seven of seven and a half to 8,000 tons apiece. Um, if you've got any loose change in terms of displacement left by the time you've finished your design and multiplied up to the 16,000 ton absolute limit, then obviously you can incorporate things like uh, flagship facilities for the leadership of the class. 
So hopefully that's clear enough. So once again, the, the idea is a light cruiser or scout cruiser designed to operate within the fleet doctrine of the nation that you've chosen, obviously using period appropriate weapons and technology for that particular uh, nationality. And you can design them to pretty much any displacement the, with the only limitation being that the total displacement of the ships must not exceed 16,000 tons, and there must be at least two of them. Um, so you have to go with, so effectively your your limit cap for any individual ship is 8,000 tons, but we will not be comparing them, and say, side by side and saying, well, because obviously if someone builds a, a class of five, 3,000 tonners, then individually those ships would be at a disadvantage against a single 8,000 tonner vessel. What we will instead be doing is seeing how closely you can build a ship to fit the doctrine of the Navy that you've adopted for this particular competition. Um, so I would strongly advise maybe having a look and seeing what historically those navies built, um, what their doctrines were, what they would have liked. And the wonderful news about it all is that being that, as suggested, you can build anywhere down to 3,000 tons, almost any navy, including many, many of the minor ones, can afford uh, 16,000 tons worth of shipping. So you're not restricted to the traditional Germany, Britain, France, Russia, um, America, Japan style navies. You can go with um, Japan, with uh, Spanish, Portuguese... Brazilian, Argentinian, Chilean, etc., etc., navies, Ottoman, whatever, whatever you want. Um, so yeah, have fun with that. And if there are any questions or clarifications you have around that description, please let me know in the comments below. And I will sign off this dry dock, saying thank you very much for watching, and hope to see you again in another video. And I hope to see some of your competition entries come in over the next few weeks.